Final has no meaning. We're already at Final Fantasy 3. No, it's not on the Super Nintendo. The game named Final Fantasy 3 in the US is actually Final Fantasy 6. I've explained before that the numbering mess in the series is due to some of the early games being kept exclusively to Japan. Final Fantasy 3 remained exclusive for longer than the others, and after playing it myself, I'd have to say this game deserved to be translated for the world much, much sooner. Square developed three Final Fantasy games for the NES, so at least Final Fantasy 3 is final in some minor way. Final Fantasy 1 was the lone game from this trilogy to get a release for the NES in the US, and none were brought to Europe. It took 16 years before the third was remade, but as usual, for this review, I'm only looking at the original NES release from 1990. As with Final Fantasy II, this release is only officially in Japanese, so I turn to the fan translation by Chaos Rush once again. It's not a perfect translation, but it is very close to the translation seen in the remakes. So, who's this story about? You get to name four characters once again. They look very similar, and they seem like kids. I'd like to introduce you to Isaac, Alex, Sarah, and Andre. No, the spelling is not up for debate. These four silly kids manage to fall into a hole together and start blaming each other for their mess. They're also understandably very scared about the place they've discovered. The player doesn't get control immediately as they take a few automatic steps into a battle. It's Final Fantasy time. Luckily, your characters are equipped with knives, and they can comfortably stab their way through this battle. Naturally, they're even more anxious after encountering these monsters. The player gains control after the first battle, and can explore the cave to find some small treasures such as money or elemental items for battles. There will be a few minor battles along the way, but they'll all be easy since there are no chances to get better weapons or armor yet. Side note, dang it Square, why did you have to get so aggressive with the flashing at the start of battles? I'll be editing it out of the review to save your eyes. The real treasure of the cave is a shiny crystal, but there's a guardian. To get to the crystal, you'll have to battle the land turtle, officially the first boss. Again, there's no real strategy right now, since it's simplified for your starting gear. Now is a good time to talk about the new and improved battle scenes, though. It's clean and much more optimized. Yes, the battle area is still just mostly black with a background above the characters, but everything about the actual battling is a big improvement. As you go through the game, you'll see many more animations and red or green numbers popping up next to the characters whenever they take damage or heal. Thank goodness for that. The text giving battle play-by-play -play was rather messy before, covering up other important information at the bottom of the screen. There's even a note on the screen to remind you which enemy your characters are targeting, which is useful if there are multiple enemies, although significantly less graceful than the damage numbers. It's also worth noting that for the first time in the series, the battle music has a percussion track. No previous Final Fantasy music utilized the NES percussion track, and it's only used in battles in the victory theme now, but that almost makes it more impactful. The victory theme is also otherwise the same from Final Fantasy 1 and 2. Okay, this is a big game and I'm still right at the beginning, so let's get on with plot stuff. An earthquake created the hole the heroes fell into, and now darkness is invading the lands. This crystal is the Wind Crystal, and now these random kids are responsible for finding the other crystals to keep the darkness away. That all feels recycled from Final Fantasy 1, but I'll take anything to keep the big bad Final Fantasy 2 away. We also have the return of the theme of Final Fantasy at this point, which was notably absent from Final Fantasy 2, and is signaling that the game really begins now. With powers granted from the Wind Crystal, you'll be able to give your characters new jobs, a brand new system for the series, and one I'm very fond of. They started off as mere onion knights, and now they can become a warrior, monk, white mage, black mage, or a red mage. Keeping up with the theme of Final Fantasy 1, I changed my party to have the first four of those jobs, sadly with no room for the last one. Defeating enemies in battles will earn you capacity points, which are used to change jobs, and the later crystals will grant more jobs to choose from. Each job has a special skill set, and some are definitely more useful than others. I didn't need a monk in my party, but I wanted Alex to beat up the bad guys with his fists, so that's what I had him do, and it worked. That's better than I can say about the customization in Final Fantasy 2. With a new look to the party, you can explore the town nearest the cave to shop for weapons, armor, and magic for the mages, and search for other loot. As usual, there are inns to heal and restore everything, and now the item shops are part of the inns. They sell potions, which are for healing, and other remedies for negative effects such as poison. And they're worth it. Oh thank goodness, duplicate items can stack in your inventory again. Not only that, you can even bulk buy items now, with a small price decrease if you do. That's not all. When you're buying your weapons and armor, you can see which characters can be equipped with them before you buy them. 
This overhaul was needed, and the whole interface in and out of battles is now very smooth, all very impressive for a NES game. The elders who raised the four chosen light warriors have some boring speech about their new roles in the world, and with the new jobs they set off for the next town. All is not well, as everyone has been cursed to be a ghost. One of these ghosts is Sid, a recurring character in the series who typically handles the airships, and funnily enough he knows how to reveal the airship here. An interesting choice to give the player an airship so early, but it's limited, as it can't fly over mountains, so its only use is to fly over a small body of water to a generic cave dungeon. This is the chance to test out your new jobs, and maybe change them if you don't like them and you have the capacity points. You'll also meet generic Princess Sarah, uh, hold up, this one's a fake Sarah, on a quest of her own to undo the curse without any help. It doesn't take long to convince her to tag along and let the Light Warriors do the fighting. Okay, the plot of this game isn't fantastic, and it isn't helped when the side characters you meet simply tag along behind you and don't fight the monsters. The battle against the Jin drags on, but it's a good test for how you'll handle the toughest fights without adding any gimmicks yet. Sealing him away again cures the curse, and a restored Sid gives the airship an upgrade to break a boulder blocking the way out into the wider world. The airship rams into it and it explodes. Well, that was short-lived. Forced to find another way to fly, the heroes foolishly disturb a dragon nest and find another character, Desh, who hatches a plan, get it, eggs in the nest, to have Dragon King Bahamut drop them all on the other side of a mountain range. Desh seems to have lost his memory even before getting flung from a tall height, so that's a subtle nest storytelling device that shows he's important somehow. Somewhere around the small landing area is a gnome village which can only be entered if the entire party is mini, and leads to another way Final Fantasy III changes up the formula. Various dungeons throughout the game might force you to go out of your comfort zone with your character's jobs. In this case, you'll have to be mini to enter the gnome village, and then there's a short tunnel. Since it's a tiny tunnel, you'll have to stay mini the whole time, and to say mini physical attacks are weak would be an understatement. As a result, it is beneficial to have a party full of magic casters, and for me, Isaac became a red mage with Alex becoming a second black mage temporarily. The tunnel leads outside very near a viking hideout where the vikings are upset about losing their ship, the Enterprise. Fortunately for the warriors, if you get it back for them, they'll hand it over anyway, but for that to happen you'll have to make things right in the Nepto Shrine. This requires being mini again, so that tunnel was just practice. Once the Great Sea Dragon is calmed, you're free to explore the seas, except a magic barrier limits the area. The new available land to explore has a cave with sightless Golgan sages, prophesying something about mankind repeating a past mistake, unbalancing light and darkness. They also drop hints about Desh's fate in the Tower of Owen, which incidentally is malfunctioning and creating the barrier in the seas. The tower must be entered through a drain, and now everyone will need to be transformed into a toad, thankfully just to enter and not for the length of the dungeon. Medusa was hijacking the furnace and threatened something about throwing the continent out of the sky? And even defeating her doesn't set things right. Instead, Dash remembers his role as the tower guardian and jumps into the furnace to save the continent. Dramatic, but now the whole continent is opened up, and it was very cool to discover that the continent was indeed floating. Like I said, the plot isn't that exciting, it's more the presentation of the game that adds all the excitement. We're still hunting the elemental crystals, and the fire crystal is in a generic fiery cave on an island, as you do. I'm just glad all the lava supposedly doesn't hurt in this game. This crystal is guarded by a very aggressive salamander, and it's definitely a more luck-based battle than the others, with its strong fire attacks. The exciting part now is the jobs from this crystal, which are Knight, Thief, Ranger, and Scholar. Knight was an obvious upgrade for the warrior Isaac, now with the ability to defend other party members with low health. The game dropped hints about a boss needing to be studied with a scholar role, which I thought would be useful for Sarah until I learned that the scholar couldn't use magic in this version. Rangers can use white magic and are also powerful bow users, so this was my solution. The boss in question is Skeleton King Hein, who has taken over the living woods, and even with an uninteresting plot, it's again the presentation that helps with the interesting themes, like this tree dungeon. It's also the start of bosses adding bigger gimmicks, as he will change his weakness every so often. Without a scholar, you won't know the new weakness, making it a lot harder, but not impossible. I'm still loving how many ways this game can be played. Another thing this game does very well, not for the first time in the series, is the impact of the scale of the world. From a rather linear start, just with small areas of land at a time, the Enterprise then allows limited exploration of the water, and eventually full exploration of the continent. Then, with another trip to Sid having acquired the Wheel of Time item, he can turn the Enterprise into an airship that will only land on water. 
It might be a small puzzle to figure out where this leads, but remember how this continent is floating? Well, what if you left the continent? Welcome to an endless ocean. It's pretty eerie, and also a little frustrating if you're looking for anything. Turns out the world is so much bigger than you thought, which makes it easy to lose the tiny parts of land while traveling. So what can you find in all this water? Shockingly, you can restore the water crystal in the Cave of Tides. As well as giving new jobs to try, it also restores masses of submerged lands, and people that I guess were frozen in time? I will say that I regret not experimenting with more jobs, as I played it very safe, only deviating from my team for dungeons that called for it, or otherwise generally upgrading the jobs they previously had. I did enjoy having Alex as a thief in my party, but I don't think Andre was terribly happy as a viking during the sections where physical damage was needed. With the world more or less fully available, I'm going to pick up the pace again for a lightning round of likes and dislikes, if you will. I enjoyed the humor of the four old men who thought they were the real light warriors. Losing the second airship to a rogue cannonball was unexpected, and this section of the game stuck in Zeronia was awesome, other than the end boss requiring repeated jump attacks from a party of dragoons. The airship acquired after this is blazing fast and soon doubles up as a submarine. It felt like the plot was actually getting somewhere when I met the ancient wizards Doga and Une, who warned about their former affiliate Zand as the culprit of the chaos. I didn't need another round of a mini-party dungeon, and while splitting monsters was a cool concept at first, having consecutive dungeons with this gimmick was also unnecessary. It wouldn't have been a failure to swap some of these out for gimmickless dungeons. Discovering the ultimate airship, the Invincible, is incredibly convenient for any resources you'll need for the remainder of the game since it has automatic shops, vending machines I guess. Its rise from underwater is epic, and it's much bigger than any airship in the series, but it's like a turtle in comparison. It can boost itself higher over mountains for just a second, which is more than other airships can do, but these areas have annoyingly high monster encounter rates. Hey, the ship opens fire with its cannons to help at the start of the battles though. It's a huge game, and there's a lot to do on the way to the end, with several useful optional quests too. I found that if I was ever grinding for levels in this game, it was just because I was close to a level up before the start of a dungeon, so I wanted to get it out of the way. Here at the end, these optional quests are substituted in instead, and it's perfect. It keeps the grind interesting, and you get items along the way. If you're playing with a summoner in your party, you can even go back to the floating continent for beasts to summon in future battles, including the Dragon King Bahamut. When you get to the final dungeon at the Silk's Tower, there's yet another optional quest for the most powerful weapons and the final job classes, Ninja and Sage. It's a long quest, with a boss guarding each individual weapon, but will be a huge help for the end here. Sadly, there's just no way it's enough. I barely glossed over it, but Zand is the real deal villain, and the game does well to make the players aware of that. It's therefore no surprise that he's waiting for a fight at the top of the Silk's Tower. To get here, you've battled bosses with very powerful elemental attacks, often damaging your entire party. So you're surely ready for Zand to cast Meteor. And everyone is dead. You can only save the game in the overworld, so it's time to start the tower all over. I don't know, there's something off about not requiring level grinding until this boss, just so you can barely survive the meteor attack. Even if you can survive it, sometimes luck won't go your way. And the worst part is that my beautiful game is about to go even further downhill. Zand is not the final boss. He had been helping the Cloud of Darkness to swallow all the light, and she's waiting for the warriors after they defeat Zand. In true JRPG fashion, she wipes out the entire party only for previous companions to be summoned for their energy. Somehow Desh returns, and then the Light Warriors head into the Dark World. By the way, you still can't save, and you have four bosses to defeat at the far corners of the Dark World before rematching with Cloud of Darkness. Of course the game is going to throw the strongest regular enemies at you too. If you're lucky, you might get a preemptive strike, or if you're unlucky, you might get ambushed. But I hadn't yet mentioned that this game introduces getting attacked from behind, which is extra unlucky due to the formation the party travels in. Typically, you'd put your magic users in the back since their physical attacks aren't often used, and you want them to take less damage, but back attacks would have them in the front row. This happens annoyingly often at the end. The goal is to defeat the bosses at the corners to release the ancient dark warriors to help restore the balance of light and darkness, but those bosses could wipe you out unexpectedly. I've been using save states to get by for a little while at this point because the Silk's Tower and the Dark World are about three hours put together with no saving. Cloud of Darkness also ends up being one of the worst final bosses I've experienced. 
She uses the same attack each turn, not quite as damaging as Meteor, but more annoying considering it's every single turn. There was seemingly a lot of luck involved in how much damage each character took, and it just wasn't ending until finally, with only Alex alive at 12 HP out of a few thousand, he delivered the final blow. A clutch ending, but this endgame was atrocious. At least there's a fully developed epilogue, but... A good RPG should have scary moments, and it should have times where you fail. If you feel like you need to grind, it would usually mean you just haven't figured something out yet. This game is a great RPG, until it isn't, which is fortunately right at the end. That leaves a mostly great game, but then it really does get ruined. When the design at the end is that bad, it's the last thing you remember about playing a game, so yes, the last dungeon can ruin everything sometimes. Let me say it again, the last section is about 3 hours without any chances to save, and the attacks that some of the bosses can do to you are enormously damaging, so I fail to see what the designers wanted other than a huge grind before the end. It's as if they didn't think the last dungeons dragged on enough already. This really hurts, because I can forgive the other things I didn't like in the game, and with how much I loved the overall game, I should be giving it one of my highest scores yet. If you haven't played the game, you likely won't understand just how badly it ended, but I believe I have made a reasonable evaluation of the game overall. The game is at a very high standard, with an impressively polished interface, and more songs than Final Fantasy 1 and 2 together, arguably even better than before too. Therefore, my final score for Final Fantasy 3 will be 7.9 out of 10. What to do about recommending this game? Obviously I recommend it, it's just a version dilemma. The NES version was the only way to play the game until 2006, where the game was finally remade with English translations for the DS. Out of the original six 2D Final Fantasy games, this was the only one not to get a 2D remake on the GBA. Instead, they went straight for a whole new 3D retelling where the characters had specific names and stories. A lot of changes were made, including allowing certain bosses to attack twice per turn, and that doesn't sound like an improvement to the endgame, but I haven't played this remake, so I won't judge it here. The 3D remake was ported to PSP, PC, and even mobile devices, but it remained the only remake of Final Fantasy III until the Pixel remasters in 2021. Despite a rough ending, I don't understand why there are so few options to play it compared with all the others in the series. The Pixel remaster is a good remake, keeping it very similar to the NES original, but for the bulk of the game, I preferred the NES again. That being said, the final dungeon gets a 10 out of 10 in this version. It's thrilling, doesn't need any grinding, and the game auto-saves before bosses. All remakes fortunately added save points in dungeons. Ultimately, I'd have to recommend the Pixel Remaster as the best version to play. Upon its NES release, the review panel for Famitsu gave it an average score of 9 out of 10, which was a top 3 score for the games of 1990. Naturally, no one was reviewing the game outside of Japan at this time, but when the rest of the world got its first look at Final Fantasy III on the DS, reviews for the remake were also largely positive. The average score sat somewhere around the 80% mark, and the game sold much better than expected. Tell me, did you agree with the points I've made? What rating would you give Final Fantasy III for the NES, initially released in 1990? If you've made it this far, I hope you'll consider liking the video and subscribing to see more. I would love it if these YouTube stats improved to show that more viewers are subscribed. As ever, thank you for watching, and please continue to be your own unique self. Treasure South Wind? Some people do have a very windy south.